Hello, everybody. Everyone have some nice tea? Good. So, Tales from the Trenches. Um, I have no idea why I use that title. Jonathan was harassing me to get my speech in. I was like, we're paying a lot of money for this. So, Tales from the Trenches. I'll try and work it into the speech somehow. So, I am uh, Daniel Fisk. I'm a co-founder, and for lack of a title that they will actually let me put on my business card, I am the CTO of RightShift. And we're the nice people who put a USB stick in your goodies bag. It's two gigs, if you don't know, because obviously you'll never need more than 640K. <laughs> okay. So what tales do I have to tell you? Well, personally, I think there are only three things I can tell you with any kind of confidence. The first was who I am which I seem to have got right. The other two is what we do and how we did it. And that will really form the basis of, of my presentation today. Uh, under the sort of how we did it, there are two parts of that. It's what we got wrong and what we got right. Um, and the two very important, well, there's, there's one very important thing there. You see I have highlighted the we part. I'm not here to sell anything to you other than maybe us a little bit. Um, but I don't know your business, I don't know what your technical challenges are, but I can tell you about ours, where we hit our heads, and some of the strategies we took in order to overcome them. So, yeah, so this is maybe just the feel-good speech for ScaleConf, or, and it's nice to see that there are a lot of new people here, because last year that was sort of one of my takeaways, that even though we weren't exactly scaling as massively or as efficiently as we were, there are a lot of people in the same boat, and there are a lot of ways to get out of that and improve your systems without reinventing your architecture or the processes you have. So once I finish with that, we'll take some questions. So without further ado, what we do. We are the largest social games, gaming developer in Africa. We specialize in social casinos. We develop for mobile and web. And I'm just reading off the cards. Uh, we support and market to millions of users. And if I continue my presentation like that, everyone is going to go to sleep. So I will put up some nice, pretty pictures for you. Because social casino, a lot of people don't really understand what that is. It's arcade games. That's the business model. People come in, they put in their 20 cents. Well, that's probably showing my age a little bit, but whatever your tokens. Um, and that's your business model. It's also known as the freemium business model. So arcade games, entertainment, and we slap casinos and sort of themed on top of that. And that is pretty much the first uh, Google image that came up for casinos. So I'm going to be a little bit more honest to you. It is not as glamorous as that. It looks a little bit more like that. <laughs> Um, but there's some cool things about it. So the business is take your arcade game, give people slots to play on it, and distribute it on Android, iOS. I put Facebook there because we have a web offering. We do work very closely with Facebook, both from a marketing perspective but from also a technology point of view. And then you get a product, and that's ClickFun Casino. That is what we do. If you're on Android or iOS, you can go play it. Give us a five-star review. Um, and that's what we do. And that happy lady over there is not just because we're happy about what we make. It's an interesting tech business to be in because that's your demographic. Um, you would think tech startup, scaling, cool stuff, people on mobiles. Our demographic is mainly women, 60% women, and a, a large proportion of them over 35. And a large, like double digits in six, sort of 50 plus which is kind of surprising. So even though we think of mobile as the, the younger generation, there are a lot of people out there playing these games online all day who are kind of old. Um, right. So that's what we do. And so how we did it. So these are three graphs. I don't know how well you can see them. But the top left one in red um, is, and they're all going up, which is a good thing, I hear. Um, the top left one in red is our employee count. Um, Jonathan actually forgot to check one demographic thing we, at the beginning. Anyone here an entrepreneur, business, startup? One, two, three. Okay, cool. okay. So we've got a couple of people that will maybe enjoy the first part of my, um, my speech. The second one um, is code coverage. 
um, in our system. And then the last one in the middle down there is uh, the number of transactions we process on a daily basis. So I'm going to talk sort of in three parts around those. The first two are a little bit short, but then I'll get into some of the technical details of how we've written a system that can scale like that. So the traditional sort of issue you have with, uh, with a startup in, in coming to terms with people is you, you, you have a startup and it's often started with your friends, your, um, you have people you have close relationships with. There's a certain implicit trust in how you do things and the quality at which it comes out. You generally work quite hard, maybe from your garage, and you make a success and you get funding, and then the next thing happens. You walk into the office, there are three, four times as many people as when you started. You don't recognize them. You say, hello, who are you? Who hired you? And I'm not even sure I like you. So <laughs> it's that fourth part that becomes a problem when you're scaling. So these were our solutions. Firstly, hiring. It seems simple. You're always trying to hire. And obviously, convincing your friends is really just about how much beer you can buy them. But we generally have a philosophy, hire smart people. And I'll tell you why that's worked for us. Actually, anecdotally, our, our rule is always hire someone smarter than you. And the caveat of that is me and my co-founder co are, by definition, the dumbest people in the office. <laughs> so so there, there are a couple of really good reasons to, smart, uh, to, to hire smart people. The first is, if you're not hiring someone smarter than you, you're going to have to teach them a lot, which is fine. You know, skill development, mentorship, there's a place for that. But when you're trying to bootstrap your business, you've got 10 guys and your investors are saying, I need 60 guys, it's not always that much time to do it because you're on tight deadlines. So hiring smart people allows you to not only have to mentor them and get them to the skill level that you want, but it also, while you're training them, they're going to make mistakes. So you're training someone and you're fixing their mistakes which can be just painful and, and slows you down. Um, so yeah, hire smart. The other thing is look at your structure. And we looked at our structure and decided you know, we're, we're scaling. How do we get it so that teams are responsible for their product? And instead of taking a more sort of monolithic, here's a pool of resources of 20 developers, they're going to pick up stories off of a scrum board. We say, let's make really small teams. Let's give them something that they're dedicated to. Let's put them in charge of a product if it is a way of looking at whether that product is kind of just your API level. And that gets a lot of buy-in and a lot of responsibility. And they tend to be a lot more aware of what's going on it and they take a lot more pride in it. So that's the way we allowed our staff complement to scale very quickly without too many headaches. Um, there are, yeah. So the next thing is process. I, it feels like there's some text missing there. but. Um, that is code coverage, and I'd love to tell you that that top line over there is 100%. Um, it ain't. Um, but, you know, n nonetheless, there are processes that you can put in place that help you scale um, when you bring on more developers or, or any of your processes in your business. Okay, so from a dev perspective, which is kind of what I think I should be talking about at ScaleCon, um, We've used Agile, and I suspect I don't really need to evangelize that in any way. In fact, I don't even feel that strongly about it. I'll tell you why we used it. One, it's flexible. Two, out of the box, it gives you metrics and a very easy way to pipeline and, and plan your product. Um, the thing that really I like about Agile is that it actually applies to other parts of your business. If you've got a creative team, if you've got uh, marketing acquisition, there's a lot in Agile or the certainly implementations of Agile that allow you to <coughs> use it across the business. So whether it's Scrum, Scrum Ban, Kanban, um, and, and let me tell you, we've moved across them. We started quite strictly Scrum. Probably our development is a lot closer to Scrum Ban and the rest of the business can ban, but they work really nicely to, together. Um, workflow. This was something that surprised me because I never thought about it. When you've got 10 guys in an office, you understand your, you implicitly understand your workflow. Um, and it was a lesson as we had people come on that were really fresh, no one knew them, and they're like, well, how do we do things? We're like, you should know you're part of the team now. It's worth actually spending a little bit of time writing down your process because it's implicitly in here because you've known it, you've started the business, you know how it works. 
but when bringing on a lot of people, if there's suddenly four new developers every month and you're bringing them in, having something maybe down on a little bit of paper, it doesn't have to be a huge document, describing your workflow can really help them school up on how you do things in the business, bring them into the culture uh, and take responsibility for what they're doing. Um, so the last thing in terms of process is your CI, your QI, QA and your testing. Now I'll be honest, that's a relatively new addition to our business um, and something that I was like, well we don't have the money for a test or a QA department and maybe you don't and there will be a point where you'll suffer for that and it's probably the only thing I will kind of say, you should try and do this. Um, it makes your life easier, you should have it, pretty much sums it up. So the last part of my talk is really um, about the system uh, and how we've scaled that, seeing as this is ScaleConf. So we have 2 million users, 3 billion transactions a month, I should have put that in there. We're on multiple platforms, which makes quite a nice um, playing field to, to, to have a bit of fun in. The thing that I like to remember when scaling a, an application to web scale is developers often go, ah, that's the fringe case, that's that edge case, one in a million. When you get to web scale, one in a million means today. You're going to put it out, you're going to have 250,000 users hammer it, and you're going to see it really, really quickly. So it's always a challenge to, to think that where you could have got away with excuses of this is an edge case, um, when you're trying to scale it to millions of users, billions of transactions, you kind of have to have the processes and the quality that you don't have edge cases or that you've thought about them. Um, just in case everyone thinks I'm full of rubbish in terms of building a system that um, can scale just in terms of its architecture, um, you'll see on that graph there's, there's a big head wall um, round about. Um, and that was no code change. The only thing we changed there was one configuration parameter in our system. We decided our players, we'd done the testing, we'd done some A-B testing in terms of monetization, engagement with the product. We said we need to give them more play time. Okay? So we said let's do that. And we did it and we went, that's just before that is about 70 million transactions a day. Uh, the next peak, which is over the next 24 hours, is 110 million. System loved it. Just said give it to me. So I think we've done a decent job of having an architecture that scales. It might not be Facebook or King.com, but we've got something there. Okay, so I was at a speaker's dinner on Monday, and at some point, a little, little bit of drinking, there was a little bit of language bashing. And uh, I kept very, very quiet. People were going, oh, we use Python, and oh, Python sucks, you should be using Ruby on Rails, use Scala, use A Erlang. And I was really, really quiet because I had done my uh, speech already and the next slide, I didn't want to get into the de debate then, but what if I told you we use a lot of PHP? <laughs> That's what I figured. But I don't think I'm alone here. Anyone else use PHP? Okay, I'm basically alone. Okay, so That's fine. Okay. And the reason is people bring out this image when they think of PHP. It's the, it's the, it's the hammer. <laughs> and you're not wrong. Um, <laughs> you're not wrong. But if you are there and you're saying, Shit, I need to scale this to millions of people, there are, there are outs for you. There are ways that you can scale it. There are, there are strategies, patterns you can apply to it that get you out without saying, okay, we've got to scrap this all and throw it out. So. Most of you will recognize that three-layer cake of goodness. And for all intents and purposes, that's what we started with. And we ran it for a long time. Um, but obviously at some point you go, okay, well, we, you know, to, achieve, to, to make this work we need millions of users, we need a lot of concurrency. How are we going to get out of what we've created here? And it wasn't a question of let's rip everything apart. And, and bear in mind this is a five-year process. We started five years ago with a very simple stack. So some of the newer things that you might be uh, banding about now, now Node.js, yeah, it didn't exist, really. Not certainly how, that I knew of. Okay, so how do we achieve this? We throw some very smart people that I told you about earlier, and we insert a lot of magic. Uh, 
and then everything works. Okay, so I'm going to give you a high level view of um, what that magic is and then I'll go talk about the strategies that got us to put it in there. There's not really enough time to kind of go in exactly how we do it and I brought along a whole lot of devs. In fact, I'm going to embarrass them quickly. Can you put up your all right shift stuff? Please put up your hands. Okay, so they're dotted around. You know who they are. Come and ask me questions afterwards or over lunch because I you know, you'll have some ideas, you'll have more questions from me. So, the first thing I want to point out, which is kind of back to the, we use a lot of PHP, I want to point something out for people who say that it's a, look, I'll, I'll never argue that PHP is necessarily the right solution, but let me show you what we've been able to do with it. We do 30 million API requests on PHP on a daily basis, which ain't bad, I don't think. Uh, 20 terabytes of outgoing traffic. So the first piece of very obvious magic we inserted is a CDN. Not, it wasn't the first, but the first line of defense. If you don't have to be dealing with that data or that traffic, give it to someone else. And it's a really cheap, simple way of getting a little bit of load off your service if you're trying to handle API requests and serve an image. That's, a, that's not going to scale very far. It's a little bit more there. We've got a little bit of load balancing, but I'll go into that uh, a little bit later. Um, the next piece of technology that we looked at was a bit of Java, and that's sort of the bulk of the rest of our requests come in at the rate of about 40 million requests per day. Um, and that's a specialized service. That's really around uh, the random number generator for our spins on our slot machine. So it's a very specialized service. and need something that can work with numbers a little bit faster than PHP and respond to requests a little bit faster. But generally, the rest of what makes our system happen happens on PHP. Um, the lots of magic expands out quite nicely. So we've got a bit of queuing with some Java Spring Hibernate consumers. If you don't know what that is, come and ask a dev. Um, and then your classic sort of L1, L2 cache just above MySQL, which is pretty much the only way you're going to scale a database, or certainly a relational database, um, cheaply, I would term it. And we deal with um, about 12,000 operations per second in our, in our caching layer. So very simply, if you take that away, you're going to have to be dealing with that on a database, which I guarantee you is all, doesn't matter what you're using, MySQL, MS SQL, Postgres, I'll, I'll be impressed if you're getting 12,000 operations a second with headroom. And dealing with peak, that's sort of average. There's a peak above that. Right, so how did we achieve this? So there were some basic strategies. Your CDN I've kind of already mentioned. Uh, load balancing is another very easy win. And it's probably the one thing we got right straight from the beginning. Um, if you sort of go back to that, with that PHP layer, your middle tier, um, we've always allowed that to, to scale horizontally, um, which may have made our life a lot easier in terms of inserting these, these, um, these other technologies, but we do very simple load balancing. We looked at hardware load balancing. We go cheap and nasty because that's how we roll. Um, so we use DNS round robining. And if that's too above anyone's technical understanding, come and ask me about it. It's really simple. It works nicely. If you're banking, maybe don't do DNS round robin. So um, the other thing was looking at where, your, where, your, where a lot of requests coming in. And, and originally, seriously, we did spins through PHP, sadly enough. But look at where your high throughput parts of your system were. And we realized, well, we're slots, so we do a lot of spins. So let's write a specialized service. And, and what's the technology we know? How are we going to do this? So what's nice with them sort of modern t uh, protocols is that you can have different language stacks, so PHP and Java. But there are so many frameworks around interoperability that those combinations become, A, very easy to make, and, and B, work really nicely. Um, so, for instance, you can talk to uh, a queue from PHP or Java or any one of a number of languages. But if you have the idea of a queue, then you, you've taken your architecture one step further. Um, caching is 
another obvious one. Obviously, the, a lot of people like the one master, multiple slave, lots of reads. You can really, really push. We really, really pushed our throughput uh, by putting a, a very robust and large caching layer between our persistent data and our sort of real-time in-memory data. Um, the other is partitioning, whether that's we, we've taken our services and partitioned them, we've taken our databases and partitioned them, just to really, once again, comes down to a little bit of specialization of your system. So the slightly less obvious things that took us a little bit longer to realize and, and the strategies we took um, sort of in, in terms of really pushing the scale and the things that don't easily pop, pop into mind or a little bit harder to, to kind of work into your stack um, is sort of evaluating um, synchronous versus asynchronous. Now, web in general is relatively synchronous. You make a request, you wait for a response. Um, if you have any services under that request, you sit and you wait, especially when it comes to databases. So we spend a lot of time saying, well, how do we make this more asynchronous? Um, and, and the low-hanging fruit there is, you know, a lot of writes that you do, they don't actually, have, you can just say it's been done and you can assume it's gonna be done and you can return to the user the data that you've already got if you're sort of updating a field. Sort of going further, you can actually say, well, instead of making 10 requests for 10 pieces of data, let's, let's keep a socket open there. And there are a lot of technology, I just list, listed WebSocket because I like it, but there are a lot of sort of proxying solutions that, yes, even work in PHP. Um, so you can have a client that sits there and you can actually push data to them through, through a, a messaging system. The other big change we did was around our data because a lot of businesses are really geared around the data. There's the, there's the data that your user needs and there's the data you need. Um, and I, I come from an online transaction processing background, so everything needs to be acid. Like, you know, it's not done until it's there and I have seven copies of it and it's written and the disk, I, you know, disk has flushed. Um, so we really started to look at embracing eventual consistency and that's really where the cues come in. If there's an, an, an operation that you can say, well, let me defer this onto a queue, um, then we've gone and done that. Um, the other sort of what came out of that was really looking at what data is entirely necessary for the system to run. So there are certain things within our system that, yeah, if, if our caching layer goes down and we have to restart populating, it's going to be gone. So there are sort of persistent NoSQL options for that. Bear in mind, five years ago, not a lot of, uh, not a lot of options in terms of NoSQL uh, and sort of document stores, especially persistent HA kind of thing. So if you're starting off, maybe look at that. Um, but given where we've come from, we, we, we took the view that there is a, a fair amount of data we actually don't need. We, we just are in the habit of saying, here's a new piece of data. We need a table for it because we're going to need it at some point, maybe in the future. Um, the other thing which was a mistake we made was, and I think it's, it might be a common mistake. I haven't spoken to too many people. but you, you build your database and then you go, this, I'm building a product for my clients, so I need five tables and, um, and that's gonna work. And then the CEO comes and says, well, I need to draw reports on it. So you're like, I'm really busy coding. Uh, here's a login, just go do what you want. You know, draw some data out of it. And then alarm bells go off because he's locked the table and your users are dying. You go, oh, I need to sort this out. So I'm gonna replicate a, a database and here's my reporting database. I'm not gonna change the structure. You go query that thing because it doesn't affect production. When you're doing, when we do about a half a terabyte of data a month that we, we crunch, um, that doesn't scale. Okay. So the way we started looking at it, which really helped was to say, we've got all these pipelines. We've got these queues where data is produced by PHP and Java. We've got consumers that do certain things. One consumer will uh, persist it to the database or update a memcache key or mem uh, a, a, data, um, a cache key. But then what we started to say is, you know, the modeling for what your user needs in terms of data and the modeling that the business needs are totally separate. Why build the one from the other? They're actually two separate exercises in, in analyzing what that structure should be. So we've started to do that. So we take a lot of our th things and we pre-process it because you have one input, you know, 
spinner reel, um, you can then break up those cues and essentially kind of replicate them, but have different consumers that interpret the data in different ways. So what we do now is some of our consumers produce just reporting data that goes into a database that is structured just for reporting. And I think that pretty much brings me to the end. I know it's sort of been a, a bit of an overview and I haven't really gone into the details of how exactly we do it, but these are some of the highlights of how we've scaled it and we think we've done a vaguely good job. If you've got some ideas on how we can get away from PHP entirely, uh, come and tell me about it. I'm sure you will. Um, the one last thing is the shameless plug. I'm very, very sorry, but uh, we are hiring. Um, I haven't really talked about the front end because this is ScaleConf, but um, there are two things I want to say about the developer positions. One, we do some really exciting stuff on, on mobile and front end. So if there's anyone here who's a little bit more interested in having a product that you can put out and have 400,000 people get the update and play with in the evening, it's kind of fun. It's slightly different to sort of agency work that a lot of sort of graphic uh, um, people are doing these days. And in terms of the back end, if PHP entirely uh, terrifies you, uh, there are two opportunities. Um, if you really love it, then come and fight for it. Um, if you really hate it, come and kill it. <laughs> so there's a lot of opportunity. And, and to be entirely honest, we're, we're moving away from, not moving away from PHP, but that layer is becoming thinner and thinner, and we write other services. And to be entirely honest, any language that makes sense, we do a lot of analysis on that. Always happy to look at DBAs. We've got a lot of, um, a lot of engineering problems, not problems, but um, ex exciting challenges in, in that. And we can always do with a couple more suits in the office. Um, the coolest thing is if you don't come through an agency, we have a signing bonus. So um, if that tantalizes you anymore. So um, I think I'm pretty much open for questions at this stage. I don't know how I did with time. 15 minutes, so 30 minutes of talking. So I've got 15 minutes of thing. Oh, I learned this last year. No one's going to ask questions unless you have some swag. And I forgot to get swag. So the best I have is uh, give me a good question and I got a pint of Grolsch for you. <laughs> the downside is I can only take four questions. <laughs> And your first question cannot be, can I have a Grolsch? Um, the queuing system, Rabbit in queue. Uh, do you, I'm not quite sure, has that got a, a persistent state? Or can you flash that to disk? Uh, or is that totally in memory, like temporary? Okay, so in terms of configuring Rabbit MQ, um, yes, you have persistent queues. So um, they, they will write to disk. You can have basically volatile or non-volatile queues. Um, it, RabbitMQ, one of the things we like about it is the concept of an exchange where you can, um, you can do some logic around the, the structure of the message and then break it up into several queues. So if it's a message type that, it's going to go to a couple of other queues. Um, it kind of has a clustering implementation that at first we used, but actually realized it didn't work entirely how we thought it was, and we've moved away from that. But um, yes, um, a, a lot of queues, including RabbitMQ, have a um, persistent option in terms of the queue. Uh, but do you use the persistent state of it? It depends on the queue. There's, there's um, some that we feel can be volatile, that aren't the end of the world if we lose, if the machine goes down. And there are others that are sort of mission critical. We want to we want to back them up if uh, if something goes down. Come get your grosh. Um, basically, what I've seen there is a slot game itself. Oh, sorry. Sorry, just a little bit louder. A bit louder, okay, there we go. Um, what I've seen is a slot game, and I just was wondering what other options are there for social gaming in that aspect? I mean, we don't have much gaming development platform, and if, you, if, if that game is there, what other options do you have to expand or scale on, or is it basically just that game itself which is available there? What are your plans in, in broadening or expanding from that? 
Okay, so a little bit of background. I, I come from the casino industry, so when I started this business, um, I stuck with what I knew. And, and five years ago, the big sort of buzzword was Facebook viral, you know, 10 million users if you just slap something up. That was the first business lesson we learned. It doesn't work that way. Um, so in terms of us, I don't see us really going too far away from casino style stuff, or certainly not gambling. We're involved in real money on, on some level, not with this product specifically, but um, what we're really trying to do is drive the change in the gaming in the real money side. So um, real money games, people come in for the excitement of winning, but there's very little engagement beyond that. And kind of the social side, people aren't coming for the money, you've got to sell them entertainment. Um, and in terms of that, we, we're, we're sort of at a convergent point in, in the industry where, where um, those, those real money operators, of which I'm sort of part, and, and a social side, which I'm also part of, um, we're, we're trying to sort of bring them together. And, and so for our business, I don't see us straying too far away from slots, table games, poker. Poker's pretty dominated, and we don't, don't really see us going into that. Um, but there are also, if you go to a trade show, it's actually amazing how many other games have been uh, monetized in the real money space. So there's sort of like bejeweled type games that you can win money on. So there, are, there is scope for that. And there's also scope to monetize the social games a little bit more in a gambling sense. Did that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. Cool. Come, ahead, come get a girl. Or I can hang on to it if you want. Okay. Just a question about your, you probably have a very large database of users using your apps. Um, do you use any strategies regarding to debt, um, user segmentation? So saying these are high spenders, these are time wasters, or anything like that, and apply strategies to it from a more business okay. point of view. Okay, so the question is, do we segment our database in terms of high rollers, people spending more, spending less, or that okay. Kind of so whether the sort of how we categorize the user. So I have a question for you. Do you mean in terms of the actual structure, or do we analyze our users? Both, I guess. Okay. So in terms of um, in terms of segmenting our, our architecture, in terms of our player profile, no, we don't do anything around. They run run on the same same system, we kind of scale, or possibly because of, uh, if you looked at this from a real money, we would probably segment for real, real casino uh, players to a slightly different system. One, it's low volume uh, in comparison to the social side. Um, secondly, there are a lot of regulatory requirements around real money. So at this stage, in our purely uh, social context, no, we don't. But there, there is kind of that segmentation and different databases when you move from sort of play money, play coins, I guess, um, to real money. Um, we do a huge amount of analysis of that data. Uh, a lot of it becoming more and more real time using, using queues. But we have four full time uh, statisticians. Uh, business intelligence guys, some with doctorates, um, who crunch that number. We, we're very much in, in, essentially in this game, you're creating an ecosystem, you're creating an economy, and if any one of you trades online, you'll realize how complicated and how many sort of things affect the economy. You've got to control inflation. So we spend a lot of time looking at those KPIs, digging in very deeply. One metric change can completely, not destroy your thing, but it, it has a lot of effects further down the line or in unintended ways. It's, it's, like, uh, it's like a big board with a whole lot of switches you can tweak and it's very hard to, to um, predict what it's gonna do. So we do a lot of A-B testing, a lot of A-B testing. In fact, there's probably not a major feature that goes, uh, probably no feature that goes out these days without any uh, A-B testing. So we segment off, off of that feature or change the parameters of the current game uh, for them and see how that performs in that cohort and then make a decision for the rest of the players. You have a grosh, well done. Thanks. That's fine. Um, 
Quick question, do you use um, EC2 to scale your servers? And <laughs> if you do use EC2, how many servers do you actually have? Because you have quite a few transactions to deal with. Okay, so I was hoping no one had asked this question. <laughs> okay, the answer is no. We run all bare metal. We release it uh, overseas, and there is a reason for that. Um, for us, where we came from, we're, we're, we're bootstrapped ourselves. Our resources are a little bit limited. We felt the rate at which we would scale from a hardware perspective didn't really warrant the, I need it up in five minutes. Uh, we have a pretty good SLA with our provider. So in terms of that, we prefer bare metal. Um, and if, if I, we had started this in Silicon Valley and we were looking to flip it um, to an investor or, or a VC, I, I think we would change our view on that. But when, you, when you're trying to make a balance between growing a business and paying, getting that business to pay for itself, um, you're, you're a little bit tight on the money. So it, it became essentially a slightly cheaper option to do bare metal. For and then, us. And then um, size of machines and, and like number of machines that you, that you have to have? Oh. Um, size of the mean machines, well, what's quite nice is because a lot of the layers scale horizontally, they're relatively low spec. I mean, like four gig core two duos are some of our servers running, no jokes. Um, databases obviously tend to be a little bit more beefy, uh, big RAID arrays, dual Xeon, um, and, and, and lots of memory often helps. Um, so I'm guessing 25 servers for everything. 25 servers. Cool. Anyone want to guess what that costs us a month? Uh, $20,000? Sorry? $20,000? $20,000. We, we do it for under 10. Oh. Yeah. That's cheap. <laughs> oh, you want, you, want, you want your beer right now? OK. <laughs> There we go. He, he's, he's going to lunch early. Um. Hi, thank you. Um, you play in the social space, so uh, from a, a startup perspective and an entrepreneur's perspective, what are your uh, marketing and customer acquisition strategies in that space? Okay, so the question was what are our because we're in the social space what are our marketing strategies and acquisition strategies um, what, as I said when we first got into it, we thought we'll slap up a, a game and people will share it to 10 million users and will not pay a cent on acquisition that doesn't happen if you see if you read any sort of social success like Zynga they bring out a new game it goes to 10 million users in the first week I guarantee you they spent 10 million dollars so you spend a lot of money to acquire. Um, it, in terms of within social, specifically Facebook, um, your, your best acquisition sort of CPIs is using Facebook as your provider. Um, you, you get the best targeting, um, and so that just really makes it the best value for money. Advertising, if you're pushing someone to a Facebook game from outside, you have that barrier to entry of fill in your Facebook uh, username. If they don't, you have a higher drop off. On mobile, once again, also Facebook is a, is a really good thing, but there are, there are a lot of aggregators that do a lot of networks on mobile, a little bit better. And also tracking on <coughs> mobile is a little harder than on, on web. So sort of tying your investment to your return on investment um, is, is a little bit harder on, on, on uh, mobile. Cool. And I think, was that the fourth of the, was that the fourth question? Do I have another growth? Okay, so anyone asking me a question after this is doing it because they actually have a question. <laughs> and I, th I think, what, we've got two minutes? Do you, do you use the standard PHP interpreter or do you use Facebook's one or maybe one that runs on the JVM? Hell yes. And that's to the first thing, native. <laughs> Just, no, straight. Uh, we, we had a look at uh, Facebook's sort of uh, compilation um, machine for, it's only right. Um, yeah, so we run it straight and, and scarily enough on Apache, and I, uh, we're also happy to run it on Nginx as well. 
So um, yeah, pretty much out of the box PHP, what is it, 5.5 now, 5.4? I don't know. Yes, out of the box. No girls for you. <laughs> hmm? Did you, did you ask me? I didn't see. OK. Of course he did. If, if he's stealing someone else's, just beat him up in the park. <laughs> there we go. Okay, okay cool. Um, other than uh, using something like Rabbit and maybe Sockets, do you have any recommendations for ways to communicate between different languages for interoperability? Ooh. Mm, not something that I would say publicly, <laughs> put it that way. I mean, uh, I, I guess the sense and, and one of the sort of lessons of doing software for so long is there are so many options and I, I would never really go out and say, use this or, or use that. That's, you know, that's foolish. I, I would so, look so at your use you case and look at what your options are and do some and decent diligence on what you it. feel. I sort of avoided the question, I'm sorry, but that's as best yeah. as you're gonna get. Sorry, I'm not sure who I'm talking to here. <laughs> kind of, uh, right, hello. <laughs> okay, um, speak to some of our devs. They'll probably have some uh, very strong opinions about that. So I think there's one, uh, there's one sitting near you there. Go find them. Is that it? I think we're also out of time. I'll Thank be you. hanging around here if you want. Um, Otherwise, sneak up on one of the devs. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.